Okay. So can you tell us your name and you know what you're doing and stuff like that? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Michael Mall. I am a software developer at a small company in Jenison, Michigan. Jenison is a uh, suburb of Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids being you know, over on the west side of the state for those of you who uh, are most mostly familiar with Snow South. Country. Snow Country. Snow Country. It's been it's it's been about the same amount of snow all the way across the state today. <laughs> um, uh, I've been a software developer for, for about five years. Um, the other thing that I do is anything and any, anything and everything I can as far as learning about computers and technology. Um, I run a website called RosettaCode.org. Um, it's just a programming web, a website for programmers, people interested in programming languages. Uh, sorry about that. And I, you know, sometime early last year, I started getting interested in IPv6. Um, IPv6 has been, tur it's turned out to be actually very easy to implement server side. Um, as far, you know, if you, Apache supports it, all of your basic tools are going to support it as far as servers are concerned. Um, the big problem I ran into was uh, Squid 2 doesn't support it, but Squid 3 does. So that's you know, it's a very simple, straightforward upgrade. I mean, your configuration files will still work. Uh, that There's not a whole lot to say about me. I'd love to say I have an incredible number of bona fides. All I have is an incredible amount of drive to learn about things. But more, on to more to, uh, towards the topic, how many, first off, I realize this is the you know, Linux users group. How many of you are actually using Linux at home? Okay, I just wanted to see if I spotted any hands that weren't up. All right, how many of you are using um, Windows at home? Okay, how many of you are using Windows XP? Well, at home okay, or cool. in a, in a, in a I, I work at home, so I do. I guess. Sure. Okay. Um, in any environment, how many of you administer X? Oh, what is it? Oh, okay. And including on your own Call personal out. workstation, like if, if you uh, if you have your own Windows XP machine. Mm -hmm. uh, what about Windows Vista? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what about Windows Seven? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and um, anybody using Macs? Yeah, nobody's going to jump on you. <laughs> we, we have, I would jump. Jump on the household has no. one. Yeah, we'll and be way out of okay. so some, some of the staff members have. Sounds like a nice Apple place to work. That I have. <laughs> All right, so uh, there's, there are some differences between Linux and Windows on IBM as far as IPv6. There's even more differences within um, different versions of Windows. Um, if you're running Windows Vista or Windows 7, um, you're running what's probably the desktop operating system that's most currently capable of handling IPv6. Um, Windows XP, it can, don't. Um, it's, it, with, uh, they have a, uh, they do have a uh, beta version of IPv6 support that you can install using a command called netsh, and that will allow you to configure IPv6 but I mean, XP is end of life, and it's going out of support, and IPv6 is still changing a little bit, and you really be are better off using Vista or Windows 7. Yes, I just said you're better off using Vista than XP. Deal with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Plus Microsoft Beta is open for anyone else. Plus Microsoft Beta is alpha for anybody else. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in Linux, IPv6 is actually very simple. Um, unless, you're, unless you're building your own kernel and you um, explicitly disabled IPv6 support, you've probably already got it. Um, how many of you avoid using Network Manager? Okay, how many of you know what Network, network Manager is? I'm talking about Network Manager in Linux. In Linux, yes. <coughs> okay, if you avoid using Network Manager, um, you're going to be mostly okay. Um, if you're using Network man Manager, you're still going to be mostly okay. Uh, there are some, there are still some bugs in, in, in terms of IPv6 support on Network Manager. Um, I worked with the devs on that one a little bit a few months ago to get one of those quirks uh, ironed out. It's getting better. Uh, let's see. So I have a good idea of the software you guys are using. How many of you are familiar with the OSI network stack? 
better question. Barely you aren't. <laughs> okay. The OSI network stack is basically um, abstracting away the different components of your uh, of your uh, network connection. You have, you know, let's say you, all of you are probably connected to the Wi-Fi here. Uh, at least those of you who brought machines. Um, you're probably familiar with the concept of Ethernet, and you've, you've, you've heard of IP, you've, 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 or you've at least heard of TCP IP. Um, the wireless network, you know, the uh, specifically you know, the radio waves, that's layer one. That's a physical layer in the OSI network stack. Um, the fact that you have something like an Ethernet frame, that's layer two. Um, on top of layer two goes your IP packets, the packets that say, hey, I want to talk to you know, this machine, and it doesn't have to be on the same little network that I'm on. That's layer three. Um, on top of that goes uh, layer four, where you'll find TCP, UDP, TCP v6, UDP v6. Most of what we're going to be talking about is layer two, layer two and layer three. Um, we're really not going to need to touch that much on the differences between T and TCP between you know, IPv4 and IPv6. <laughs> but layer two and three are very interesting. In IPv6, every machine that you have, every network interface that you have, is going to have multiple IP addresses. You're going to have the IP address that corresponds to your local, that corresponds to layer two, sorry, that corresponds to your local network. <coughs> so, for example, if you're all plugged into the same you know, Ethernet, you know, Ethernet switch, you're all you're all you know, directly communicable uh, communic using your link local IP address. On top of that, you would have, some, um, you have an address for your global scope. Your global scope means that you can get to my server from wherever you are, or that I could get to your system if the firewalls didn't block me. Global scope is routable, your link local scope is not. Uh, we usually use a whiteboard at this point. You can use that. I was just saying, do we have a whiteboard too? Yeah. <laughs> I can go out in the warehouse and get a stand for you. Hang on. There's one behind the thing there. No, it's broken. Would you be comfortable maybe putting a laptop with a graphics software on it? What's that? A laptop with graphics software, maybe? Uh, if my if my tablet with a stylus still works, probably. probably. I'm better at drawing than using a graphics software. Mostly, what I'm actually going to do is write so small, none of you can read it. I suspect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think perhaps touching my laptop it'll work a little bit better. But your, in IPv6, your uh, IP addresses, they're, uh, the first 32 bits of your IP addresses are very meaningful. In fact, I should probably backtrack a little bit and talk about the different, you know, one of the significant differences between IPv4 and IPv6. In IPv4, um, your addresses are all 32 bits long. Four bytes, four, four ASCII characters. Uh, that's not a whole lot. That's only, I say only four billion addresses. And that's okay, I can go somewhere. All right, your, in IPv6, addresses are 128 bits long. That's, uh, much larger number of addresses. That's you know they like it's like it's said that that's enough addresses to you know have an individual IP address for every grain of sand on the planet. We'll probably run out long after I'm dead. <laughs> In IPv6, you have um, you have so many addresses that they actually gave the first 32 bits of each address a special meaning. If you have uh, If you have an address that's linked local, that address is going to begin with F E and Parker just died. I think I'm gonna wait for the yeah. laptop screen to come up there. Do you want me to go get you another marker or No, I'm alright. KDE uh, or LXDE or any of your normal desktop managers. My apologies in advance. As long as it works for you, who cares? Yeah. Uh, 
Whatever works. Go and work versus Katie Eagle or anything, I'll be fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> LXDE win. I, I do like LXDE for if you need something that's familiar to a Windows XP user. All of your uh, all of your Windows XP keyboard shortcuts port directly over. So like that. Mm -hmm. All right. So. So don't we need a colon between the E and the A? Um, no, actually, each section of a IPv6 address consists of 30 um, consists of uh, 32 bits. Um, and what you what you might notice here is I actually have two colons there. What that means is that the rest of it's filled with zeros. The IP the addresses are so long that somebody decided I don't want to type that many zeros out. An address that begins with FE80. That's a link local. That's valid on your local network. Uh, an address that begins, for example, with 2002, that's something called a 6 to 4 address. A 6 to 4 address is, a, is one way that you can get on IPv, the IPv6 network if you have a public IPv4 address. Um, if something begins with almost everything else, but for an example, we'll use uh, 2001. That's one of you know, one of many 32-bit prefixes for global IPv6 address space. I'm sorry, say that again. One of many prefixes that's valid for the global IPv6 address space. Uh, I have a question. Can we go back to FE80? Yeah, sure. So FE80 is private address space, basically. So, but that would be like here. I'm running on. I'm on the 10 dot in inside the building here. So that would be equivalent to that kind of a thing? Not exactly. What you're thinking, the, the closest equivalent to that would be something called uh, the UFA, um, which is kind of like a site local address space. Uh, those begin with FE, um, and then numbers which I don't recall. I don't know how, many, how much of that you can read. It needs to be a very small text. Uh, I don't think I have, get it, but I think I have uh, a better terminal install at the moment either. But well, I, I don't think anybody can read that. Okay. Well, I'll Is that a way of just that. making it larger somehow? I'm using X term. I have to modify the X, the X resource. Didn't like it. Didn't like <laughs> yeah, but it's above. It. It's it's bigger than your screen. So at the top, <coughs> you 
you, uh, that's my loop back, that's my loopback address. All of your machines have a loopback address. That's so programs on your computer can communicate with other programs on your computer without ever hitting most of the uh, network stack uh, without, and without going over your local network. So um, in IPv6, it's all zeros. Yep. In IPv6, your local uh, your loopback address is actually if you can see where it says INET6 there. It's colon colon one slash 128. How many of you are not familiar with CIDR notation? Oh, okay. a little bit. Have any of you ever heard of a slash 24? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's the same thing. What, what, CIR, what CIDR notation corresponds to is the fact that you have this many bits of address space and you decide, okay, up, you know, your upstream ISP is responsible for this part, and you're responsible for that part over there. And I probably should have flipped that around because that was more me reading my left to right. But, so for example, here you see where it says INET 127001 um, slash A. Matt, can you close this down or move it so that... Oh. You can smell. No, okay, all right, just start it. All right, fine. All right, yep, okay. okay. Actually, why don't I just go ahead and select it here. Here's your localhost IPv4 address, 127.0.0.1. That slash 8 means that the first 8 bits of that, the, um, specifically the 127, those are fixed. And the rest of it, the remaining uh, 24 bits, those could be whatever. Um, it's, it's thinking of itself as having about 24 bits of address space internally to work with. Wow. With IPv6, your addresses are all 128 bits long. So if you have a slash 128, that means that you're actually not responsible for any of it. Uh, it's, very, it's very much fixed. Since the, you know, the 128 corresponds to the entire bit, uh, length of the address. If I scroll down a little bit, So where it says that, mm -hmm. so like where it says INET 6, 1 slash 128, that means that it's fixed. It's all zeros except for the one at the end, and that's it. That's the whole address. There's nothing else involved. In. Right. Okay. And you can see that there's the double colon, the preceding the one, which means it's 127 zeros, then a one, and that's your IP address. And GRE, I'm not actually using that. Sit, I'm not using that. It's zero, and where do you connect that to? It's not actually attached to anything. But it still has an IPv6 address, if I can find it. Is it that link after that? Yeah, that's the MAC address. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's actually your uh, MAC address listed right there. That has a link scope. You're not seeing it. What's link tunnel mean? Link tunnel? Um, that's... Oh, I know what's going on. What's wrong here? <laughs> I didn't attach the wireless network yet. Oh, huh. I'll make it. Carrier, no. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll make no carrier. Okay. Okay. And let's actually look specifically at the. Uh, Does IPConf not show the same things you're trying to look at? Or? Uh, if config will sh uh, if config will show it the same stuff in a different format. Uh, let's see, there's my IPv4 address on the local network. 
Remember what I was talking about CID, uh, CIDR notation? There's a slash 16 at the end of that. And what that means is anything after that 10.0 number, um, so I'm dot three dot one oh four, but any you know, if any of those other numbers were to be different for anybody else in the same network, I could talk to them directly without going through a router. So it's a class B. Um yeah. CIDR stands for classless internet uh internet something I probably can't remember anymore. But uh, what it what it comes down to is you know class A, class B, class C, those were great back when we could, you know, conveniently divide things in terms of eight bits or sixteen bits or twenty-four bits. On my home network, I've got my you know, I've got my wired and my wireless network divided into two different slash twenty sevens. It doesn't quite evenly fall into a class class based thing. I mean, just because I'm sharing you know, our, the RFC nineteen address space with a few other people. Um, I actually have you know, set myself up in a specific slash 24 so that I don't end up uh, conflicting with any of them and dividing that internally for my own purposes. But yes, the slash 16 means that there's about 65,000 IP addresses that I could talk to without bouncing off you know, the school's route. Now, here we have, okay, WN0. I got six, so that's an IPv6 address. FE80 means it's a link lo local address. Um, also, at the end of the line, you can see it wraps. It comes back down to the word link. That means that it's telling me that, hey, this is a link local, you know, this is a link scope address. Here we see two columns. means, you know, it's going to fill it with as many zeros as it can. As it needs to. As it needs to. And over here, that's a number that's derived from my MAC address. Um, in order to avoid having to talk to a DHCP server or you know, anything you know, or any additional external uh, uh, configuration tool, IPv6 uses your system's MAC address very frequently. That's going to be really, it's going to come in really cool when you find out that setting up IPv6 on a network is incredibly easy once you actually have that. So you're saying with IPv6 there is no more DHCP server handing out addresses? There doesn't need to be. There can be if you want it, and in fact, I don't know. As a network administrator, I would feel uncomfortable hanging <laughs> out the addresses. You know what I'm saying? I understand. So like I said, there can be if you want it. And the big, one of the biggest uses of uh, <coughs> one of the biggest use of uses of DHCP is to be able to push configuration information, like you know, where are the DNS servers? Yeah, are. and DNS servers and static. How do you assign a static address if you're not pushing out the addresses? Um, the addresses are static by default. Because the room your MAC address isn't going to change. Right. Um, so basically, you're giving an ad, you're giving a lifetime address to a device. Yeah. In fact, you're giving. A, you know, you have a, be it a telephone, a network card. Um, I'm a curious situation. Mm -hmm. I, I have I, I have a, a network card. Okay. I take it off the computer A and put it in the computer B. Yep. Does it give that address? Computer yes. B has the address that was previously associated with computer A. It only has so half the address. The so it goes to the rather than the CPU. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, for internal resources, if I were using IPv6 here, okay. part of our part of our structure here is we rent some space out to somebody else. Okay. They recently installed a VPN device, and I had to point one of my external IP addresses to that VPN device. Okay. How do I, how do I do that in IPv6? Well, in IPv6, what you would do is you would probably give them a prefix. Um, let's say, that, you know, I, do you have, a, do you, are you given a, a network range from your ISP, or did you go to Aaron and, and get it? No, I have five addresses for my ISP. Okay. Um, so what you, would pro what you would probably do is if your ISP offered IPv6, or if you went through a tunnel provider like Hurricane Electric, um, you would get um, a slash 48 or maybe a slash 56, um, which is uh, a lot of a lot of IP addresses. Right. Yeah. And what you would do, what you would do is you would actually take, you know, let's say you got a slash 48, and you wanted to give them their own slash 56. You would say, okay, you know, show me, you know, give me, you know, the initial address of your router, and the you guys can have. Well, yeah, it would it would it would be prob probably the link local address. It's up to you how you do it. Once once the machine has 
Once the machine has the way I did it here with the IPv4 mm -hmm. is I assigned them a static address mm -hmm. and then I pointed my the the gateway and said this external address maps to this internal address. Okay. Well, what would happen is you would know their internal IPv uh, IPv6 address, um, whether whether that's a link local address or a global scope address, which there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem that's clearly resolved, but. If you, if you know their address, what they do is you know, their machine becomes its own router. You have, if, if you have a, a slash 48 that's globally routable, you can divide that up into as many you know, sections as you want and give that to somebody else and they can have it run operating on their own router. So your ISP will give you, you know, it, you know a large, large amount of space and you would say, uh, go ahead and use this. Um, I'm going to use G to represent your section of the address and um, B for theirs, and I for the ISP. The I, you know, so you've got 128 bits, mm -hmm. and the ISP is going to control this much of it, and otherwise the rest of this is yours. Mm -hmm. And you can say, well, they come in, ISP still controls this much of it, and you're going to give that much gets it down. Now I'm going to retain the G part. Right. Now, the thing is, this really extends more like this. And let's say you have you know, somebody else, <coughs> or you have a computer lab where you want you know, them to have their own range of addresses where they can you know, go, go do whatever they want, and you don't have to worry so much about them affecting the network. network. So this is your experimental lab. You know, so let's say you gave them a slash 56. You give your experimental lab <coughs> slash 56. You can do that because your slash 56 just represents you know, a different chunk out of your larger address space. And it's one of the really, really nice things about IPv6. So basically DHCP is history. No, you can still use DHCP if you want to. And DH DHCP is very much advocated by enterprise users, specifically because you can provide you can provide more configuration info, info, uh, information. You don't need to. Uh, because you still have to. I still have to push DNS. How do you? You know. You still have to write. Mm -hmm. Even though it's IPv6 now, I still have to push the DNS server. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. And still need. So I would still need DHCP. And, yep. And d there's a difference between DHCP and DHCPv6. Not a whole lot of difference, but you know, and your configuration options if you're using uh, like if you're using um, ISCs. DHCP server, what are you using to handle it? It's a Linux process? font, whatever. And just the DHCP. Okay, that's probably by ISC. Their IP, the IPv6 <coughs> version of their DHCP server configured essentially the same way. Um, now, the, the, there is a difference in how you get to the DHCP server <coughs> in, IP, uh, in <coughs> IPv6 as opposed to IPv4. In IPv4, you plug the machine into the network and it says, um, hey, yeah, I need an IP address. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Wireless network with a lot of loss. Somebody <coughs> says, hey there, what? I can't hear you. So in, uh, in IPv6, you plug a machine into a network and it doesn't do anything. Instead, what happens is your router broadcasts something called router announcements. Your router, annou uh, your router announcement's going to say, well, in, 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 the, in a very basic configuration that doesn't include the HCPv6, your router announcement is going to say, yeah, um, I'm your local neighborhood router. Um, I control, or rather, you can, you can use you know, any of this, amount, uh, of this amount of address space and here's your prefix. And the prefix being you know, either what the ISP gave you or whatever you decided to subdivide to that particular area of the network. And you know, every machine that hears that has the option of saying, okay, well, here's my MAC address. There's the prefix. Prefix, MAC address, zeros. Good, I've got my IP address. It's incredibly easy. Now um, you could even use that for security by, say, turning off the, bro the broadcast or the advertisement that you're a router, mm -hmm. continue routing, but not let anybody else know uh, on the network after that point. Would that to be correct? To an extent. There, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of, in, it's a lot of di different and interesting ways of security for some of the questions in an IPv6 network. Um, but, for example, I use programmer.com for my VPS. 
I run a server, and that's you know that's in their data center. Now, you know, they give me data by IPv6, right. but, but they're not pushing router advertisements. Mm -hmm. um, they actually gave no. Well, they didn't tell me which address to use. Instead, there's an address that you can ping. That's a multicast address, and anything that is a router will respond. Hmm. Which actually can be really interesting. But so, so yeah. you have to set, if you were in that type of a situation where your router wasn't going, woohoo, yeah. then each machine would have to be set up that once it acquired a network connection, it would send a thing on a multicast band. Normally, you would normally you would use router analysis if you did if all of the machines in question were not you know preconfigured pre configured or static. Right. Like for example, in the act in the virtual servers case, those machines don't need to ask what the router. Right. Because when they come up, they know what they're going to use. Right. Um, and the same way you configure a static address on a card now. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, now you wanted to use DHCP. What you would do is in the in the configuration for RADVD. We have a, uh, that's the tool that's on that's available on most Linux distributions to send a router announcements. Um, you would say, uh, we're going to use some of the, the, the enhanced configuration and they're going to go to that address to talk to the UCP server. And what that's mostly going to do is say, all of this information, well, you don't get that much from me, but hey, I am the router and you need to talk to that guy with your address in the additional configuration. Router announcements are spec'd to support pushing information like DNS. Um, Windows doesn't, the Windows doesn't support that yet, and neither does Network Manager or any of the Linux systems yet. So the router announcement can say, hey, I'm the router, but go here to get your address. Right, just like in DHCP, you're able to have your DHCP server say, um, yeah, I'm a DHCP server, but you want to talk to that one over there. To get out of the building. Right. Um, it's like DHCP proxies, but yeah. proxies that nature. Uh, I was thinking gateway, but... Well, that's, yeah. It's <laughs> completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll get back to you because I kind of cut you off a little bit. Go ahead. Are there well-known addresses for domain name servers and that sort of resource on the local, on local links? Um, well-known addresses? Well, here, here's a couple of them. Uh, and I, actually, I'll probably, like that. I'll demonstrate one of them just because it's that fun. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember how to do this. Like, like all of three days, and for some reason I'm forgetting now. something that call, called IPv6 glue, which is which is important, and that's what uh, that's what the uh, the ComNet and Org are already configured to be able to do. If you go through um, Hurricane Electric's um, IPv6 certification, once you get to the final stage of that, um, you end. Uh, <coughs> it actually goes. It touches on that side, uh, the issue of IPv6 glue and being able to have D uh, DNS operate ideally. Optimally on IPv6. 
Um, you had a question earlier, and I was still responding to him, and I forgot to get back to you. Uh, you answered it already. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. One of the things that's interesting, uh, interesting and different between IPv4 and IPv6, how many of you know what ARP is? Mm -hmm. okay, how many of you do not know what ARP is? Okay, for those who don't know what ARP is, ARP <coughs> is when you have a machine on, a, on your local IPv4 network, and it wants to talk to another machine on your local IPv4 network. And the problem with it, the problem is, it needs to actually send the message directly. Uh, it needs to build a packet that actually operates on your Ethernet, well, at the Ethernet layer instead of just on the IP layer. It needs to know the MAC address of the target machine. And so it will say, hey, everybody, uh, who has 192.168.0.1? Uh, anybody? And ideally, the person who is that address, who has that address, will say, yo, that's me. And at that point, both machines will know the MAC address of the other machine, and they'll be able to send a packet. They'll be able to use Ethernet to address the pa packets back and forth. IPv6 doesn't use ARP. IPv6 uses something called neighbor discovery. As it turns out, Ethernet supports multicast at the Ethernet layer. And neighbor discovery takes advantage of Ethernet multicast so that it doesn't bang all 48 ports of your switch in order to find out one, to find one individual. And the resolution of IPv or of Ethernet multicast means that it can it will be able to typically only hit about 1 16th of the, of the nodes in your network when it's trying to find who it wants to talk to. Mm -hmm. So what that'll do is, for very large networks, that'll reduce your load. Um, at least when talking to an IP address it hasn't talked to before. Uh, let's see, we have... Um, DNS. DNS is a little bit different. Um, how many of you know all that much about DNS? We need to find all that. Okay. How many of you know that what an A record is? How many of you do not know what an A record is? Okay. In DNS, an A well, DNS is a very large database, and for any any given domain name, you'll have several you know, several records. Um, you can have an A record, which corresponds to an IPv4 address. So if you want to know what the IPv4 address of Google.com is, you ask your DNS server, okay, um, what is the A record for Google.com? If you want to know what the domain associated with a particular IPv4 address is, you look up the PTR record, the pointer record. If you want to know where the mail server is for a given, for a given domain, you look up the MX record. The biggest difference between IPv4 and IPv6, as far as DNS is concerned, is in IPv6 you use a, what's called a quad A record. That's four A's instead of a single A. It's not four A records, it's just a record that has the name four to go, that consists of four A's. A quad A record has uh, just the, uh, the, the global scope, well, generally speaking, it should be the global scope IP, uh, IPv6 address. So if you want to know the IPv6 address of Google.com, you'd ask your DNS server for the quad A record of Google.com. This is pretty straightforward. Pointer records are used pretty much the same in both IPv4 and IPv6. In IPv6, in both cases, you have your uh, least significant digit first um, and, and work your way towards your most significant digit. In IPv4, each digit is, uh, in IPv4 you have a, des a decimal value of 0 to 255. And that'd be you know, your decimal value, dock your decimal value, dock your decimal value, dock your decimal value. In IPv6, you work your way back, uh, you work your way using in hexadecimal, using one character at a time. Uh, they're much longer records. And no, you can't use the nice little double colon shortcut. It's nice to have those auto, uh, handle automatically. That's the big difference between IPv4 and IPv6 on DNS. Let's see. Uh, how many of you have played with IPv6 already? Um, I do know that uh, some. I got as far in Hurricane Electric's thing. I got as far as where you had to then get a have them assign you a block of address. So basically. 
Okay. Um, there's a. I don't know how many of you have asked your. I, do you know if your ISPs offer IPv6 yet? Most still don't. Most don't. Some do. Um, well, so which ones in the area are likely to? Is AT and T? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> um, and even in my area, Comcast. Comcast is already rolling out IPv6 in Michigan. Um, AT and T not quite as quickly. Is that a DSL provider? Cable. 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 Wide, was it wide open? Oh, they're, they're providing everything now, too. Cable, TV, and uh, internet. So. Well, you'll, you'll, need, you'll need to ask them. I don't, um, I'm not familiar with them. Um, ask them if they support IPv6. If you can't get native uh, IPv6 support from your upstream, there are several ways that you can still get IPv6 support. Some work better than others. But as far as the current you know, set of ISPs that are offering IPv6, like I said, Comcast is beginning to roll it out in Michigan. AT&T is working, at, um, is, they like to say they're the, the front runner, but the funny thing is they're only starting in spring, really, and then only the government customers, because government customers are mandated to support IPv4 and IPv6 natively. Good. Very soon. <laughs> um, there's, there's not a whole lot of yeah. So I'm currently paying AT&T for IPv4 addresses. Is there other options? Do I want to continue to pay that uh, fee? Are you using um, are you using the Uverse or are you using yes? Okay. You um, static. Static, right? You're paying them for static IPs. Yep. One of the problems and the thing I really don't like about AT&T Uverse is that. You can't. You're really stuck with AT&T. If, you're, if you want that, if you want the uh, the VD, what's called VDSL, which is like the next level up above ADSL, which is what you've got. You have. I'm sorry. You, I should say you have VDSL if you're using Universe. Um, AT&T uses 802.1x authentication in order to guarantee that you're using their equipment with their internet connection. Um, and as far as I know, they are not reselling VDSL to anybody else. So it's not like you with it, not like with ADSL where you can go and say, well, I'm going to switch to this ISP because they'll offer these other services that I like. <coughs> um, as far as ISPs in your area, DSL, you, you, there are DSL providers which you can go to who offer IPv6. One of the ones I talked to, the point of presence is in Seattle, even though they can't resell um, ADSL in the Grand Rapids area. Um, I'd end up taking a latency hit, which means the package would take a little bit longer to get from point A to point B. That's well, so, okay, so I guess my question more is, uh, can I drop my V6 or V4 purchased static and get a V6 from somebody else? I mean, is it possible to like route that way? Sure. They have to be able to provide you service. Well, you'd want to keep your four address until oh, wow. everybody's using the six because otherwise you're going to yeah. have a lot of people not able to access your server. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem right now. And that, you know, websites don't want to use V4 because nobody nobody has V6 service and nobody wants to provide V6 service because hey, there's no V6, nobody using the V6 address space. You have actually, you do have options. Um, we're, right, what we're talking about now is the problem of transition. Mm -hmm. How do you transition to going from V4 only to both and yeah. ultimately you know, to V6 only? It's I actually really hard to become an ISP right now because there are no more addresses available. Right. I, I think now. the government mandating everything be accessible by V6 is going to spur it on because that will that will put government employees in the position of have telling their ISPs, hey, I need V6 service, and if you don't provide it to me, I'm not going to